Father, this is your word, and we do thank you for it. And we do ask that you would do good things in our hearts this morning through your word. I pray for encouragement for those who are discouraged. I pray for faith for those who don't have any. I pray for encouragement and endurance and perseverance for those of us who are feeling like we want to give up. And Lord, I ask that this story would cause within us to, a desire to run to you for safety, for security, for salvation. Please let us not miss anything that you would have for us through the story of Ruth and Boaz and all that you're doing in this text. And God, I pray for the help to rightly communicate. Please keep me from saying anything that would be hurtful or harmful or confusing. And I beg that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see. Jesus, you said that a lot when you spoke. And I ask that you would please allow us to just settle our souls and be able to receive what you'd have us to, see, to receive today. Let your goodness rest over our time in your word. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. You might have a tendency to sometimes wonder, does God care about the details of your life? Is he even concerned about a, an aging bachelor, um, a wounded widow, uh, a, a barren, childless woman? Is he concerned about unemployment? Is he concerned about poverty? Is he concerned that you have to scrape and scratch to make ends meet? Do you ever feel like the details of your life just go unseen and there's no one who's really watching over you? But relationships are confusing. You feel like a stranger in a strange land. You, uh, you wish things could be different and, and you wonder, does God care? I, I think all of these questions, this text has something to say today. And I pray that by the end of our time together, you'll have a little bit of a hint that there is an opinion from scripture on and, and having an answer to those questions. So if you're with us for the first time, we are moving through the book of Ruth. We've, um, we've begun a couple of weeks ago, and so each chapter of the book of Ruth is written kind of like a, a, a one-act play. You might think the whole book is a kind of a four-act play with one chapter for each, um, each act, and this takes place in about somewhere around 1300 BC at a time period when the judges rule the land in, in Judah and Israel and there is no king. So one of the, the markers of this period is there's no king to, uh, to rule and everybody does right in what's in his own eyes. And so it's a kind of a bleak period in this period of, of the history of Israel. And we zero in into one family and primarily one woman named Naomi who grew up in Bethlehem. And you know the little town of Bethlehem. And it should ring familiar in your ears. There's something that significant happened later on in that little town. And we're sort of building to that is where the Lord is taking us in the, in the history of what's happening in the Bible. We're moving in that direction to some major events that happen in Bethlehem. There's a famine in the land, probably because of the idolatry in the nation of Israel. And so Naomi and Elimelech, her husband, to escape the idolatry, leave, I mean, escape the famine, leave the land of Judah, and they go to a foreign land, Moab, a land... Um, not part of the nation of Israel. They stay there for a while and then tragedy strikes the, li the lives of Naomi. Her husband dies and then her two sons marry Moabite women, which was probably um, against God's will. And then after that, about a period of 10 years passes by, the, both sons, neither of them have any children. So they endure this decade of childlessness and then both sons die. Naomi's devastated, and so she decides, uh, she's wondering what to do, and she hears there's food in Bethlehem, and so she goes back home. On the way back home, she has a conversation with her two daughters-in-law that says, basically, I am a hopeless woman, go away, go find another life in your hometown, go back home. 
Orpha goes back home and Ruth begins to stay with Naomi and she pledges her allegiance to her and she goes back to her hometown of Bethlehem, which for Ruth is a completely new land. This is a completely new people, a completely new place and they worship an, an, a God she doesn't know. And then the unf- that's the end of, of act one. And as we move on in, uh, to act two, we see Ruth is very bitter. Ruth chapter one she, at uh, the very end of chapter one, she explains all, how she feels about all that's happening in her life. And she says in verse 20, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I think I said Ruth, I meant Naomi. Naomi is, is bitter towards all that's happened. She's lost a husband, she's lost sons, she's had to leave and had to move and she's going back empty handed and she's very bitter about the circumstances of her life and yet she returns home. And that leads us into act two, which takes us back to Bethlehem and then Ruth, out of her pledge of wanting to help her mother-in-law has said, I'll go to work in a field. And it's interesting because she just happens to arrive in this one particular field that is owned by Boaz, who just happens to look favorably upon Ruth. And Boaz just happens to be a relative of Elimelech, who's Naomi's dead husband. And of course, we realize uh, this is not just happening. This is not just chance. God is at work. And this is one theme we just sang into. God is at work even in the dark times of your life. The periods where life seems bleak and hopeless, uh, there is hope and God is at work. And so by the time we get to the end of chapter two, Naomi, who has said, I am filled with bitterness and God has dealt bitterly with me because of all of the calamity that he's brought in my life, the, the bitterness turns into blessing at the end of chapter two. And she says this, after Naomi finds favor in this field and comes home with a boatload of grain, she says to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord, and that's Yahweh, that's the personal name of God, whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. This man, Boaz, is one of our redeemers. And so what she's saying is, I thought God had abandoned me. I thought he had forsaken me. And yet he hasn't because of Boaz. And he, she makes this word, uses a word redeemer, which has import into this particular chapter for three reasons. A redeemer can marry a widowed uh, relative and raise up children to the, the, the brother or the relative who has died. He can buy back the family land that has been sold prior to them moving off to Moab. And he can take care and provide for those who are needy. So the word redeemer is crucial in her understanding of this potential role of what Boaz might do. And question, how many of you have ever been in a place in your life when you felt like, I could use a redeemer. I could use someone to step into my dark situation and offer a little help. I'm confused. Somebody help. This is a cry of the book of Ruth. This is a, a, a silent aching for our, from our hearts. And, and some of us stand in those very places today where we could use some help for someone to step in. Naomi has a little clue that Boaz might be able to help. And that sort of takes us to the end of of chapter two and introduces us now to to chapter three or act three, if you wanna say that. So this is where we're headed today. So I've caught you up. You know where we've been and where we're going. And so today, there are basically three scenes in this chapter. The first begins with Ruth and Naomi at home as a little conversation that they have. And then the second scene is out in the field, particularly on the threshing floor, uh, out in the the grain fields. And then the last scene is back at home between Naomi and Ruth. So that's where we're headed, at home, then out into the field, and then back at home. So let's take uh, a look at the first first. So some time passes, probably a couple of months by the time of the closing of chapter two and the beginning of chapter three, the barley harvest and the wheat harvest has taken place. That's probably a couple of months has gone by. So if you're wondering how much time has elapsed, it's about two months or so. Verse one, chapter three. Naomi, uh, her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Rest, my daughter, may I seek rest for you? This is a rhetorical question. The answer is expected, and of course we understand the answer to be yes. Shouldn't a mother-in-law seek rest? So this time has elapsed, something's gone by, and she's like, well, I think I need to do something. 
I, I need to seek rest that life can be good for you. Because remember, there's no man in the house. There's no one to take care of them. And this word rest is a unique word. It means the kind of security and tranquility that comes from being in a marriage relationship. This is particularly aimed at the, the security, the steadfastness, the safety and protection that comes from being in a married home. So she's saying to Ruth, I, I want to find someone for you. I want to find a home for you to settle down so that you can dwell in and be safe. It's the same word she used at the very beginning when she tried to persuade Ruth to go back to her Moabite village. In you know, chapter 1, verse 9, she prays this. May the Lord grant you, and it's Yahweh there again. God's personal name is used throughout the book of, of Ruth. May Yahweh grant that you may find rest, each of you. She's talking to both of her daughters-in-law. In the house of her husband. There's that rest. There's a sense of goodness and quietness and tranquility from being in a relationship where you're protected. And I, I just, uh, I wonder, how many of you would describe your homes as a place of rest? Wives, you feel rested at home? When you say home, do you think of a mountain of things to do? <laughs> well, there are always things to do, but the kind of rest comes from the security of a relationship. That protection and that love. It doesn't mean that you never work at home, but it means your work is valued and cherished. And husbands, this has something to say to us. What kind of home life are we creating? And if guys, if you don't have a home, you need to begin to think about that. How am I going to shape home life so that my wife feels secure, that she feels safe, that she feels loved, that home is stable? This is a, a real admonishment for us. This is what Naomi's yearning for. Husbands, this is what we are to provide to our families, not just our wives, but to our whole families, a place of rest and security. So that's what Naomi is aiming for. That's the motivation. Naomi's been criticized a lot for what she says and what she's about to say, what we just read. And this, um, you know, this little mission she's about to send Ruth on. I don't think there's anything sinful in, at all in what Naomi's doing. She's desiring to find a place of stability for her daughter-in-law. And we'll, we'll see that as we unfold. But she comes up with an idea. And here it is. It's pretty crazy. Verses 2 to 5. Is not Boaz our relative? So rest, finding a place of rest, is connected to a husband. You see her thinking. Is not Boaz our relative, whose young women, uh, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So wash and anoint yourself and put on your cloak. Go down to the threshing floor, but don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, observe where he lies, and then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, I'll do it. So is Naomi here a manipulative mother-in-law or a masterful matchmaker? Who, who's your mother-in-law? <laughs> Which category does she fall in? What, what's Naomi up to? Is something going on here? She knows Boaz's work schedule. And so she invites her, go visit him. So uh, the threshing floor, the, the barley, the threshing floor is a hard packed dirt surface where grain could be winnowed, tossed up into the air with a pitchfork or, or some other kind of fork in order to, to break off the husk from the wheat. The husk then blows away in the wind. It's useless. And uh, so it's sometimes this threshing floor is up on a hill, a, a kind of a, a raised area in a field so that the winds would carry away the, the, the useless part and the grain would fall to the ground. It could be swept up then into a, a pile and then used and then bagged and, and um, co you know, cooking and making bread and, and so forth. So this is, this is where this is happening. So this is the harvest time is, is what the, the picture is. And so she says, go take a bath, anoint yourself, verse three, um, and go put on your, get your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. Now the question is, what is she saying? In go wash, go anoint yourself, and put on your cloak. If you've got the NIV, the NIV translators will tell you what they think because the word for cloak will be your best clothes. Now, the word is simply cloak. 
It's simply a word that is used in a generic sense for both men and women. And it is also used later in scripture in Exodus as a, a kind of garment you can sleep in. Exodus 22, 26 and 27. If, you, if ever you take your neighbor's cloak in a pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering. It is his cloak for his body. In what else will he sleep? It's the same word. So I don't think necessarily we have to understand Naomi to be saying, go get your sequin dress on so Boaz will be blown away. I don't think that's what's happening. And when you come to difficult texts in scripture, how do you handle them? When you, when you come to a phrase that you're not sure what to do with, you go and look for it elsewhere in scripture and see, can I find this again so that it can inform the meaning? So this phrase we find again just a couple of books over in 2 Samuel chapter 12. And this time it's King David. David is just finishing mourning the death of a little infant son and we see the same phrase almost exactly in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12 verse 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. That's the word. It's exactly the same. It's the same word. And he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. So what's going on? This washing, um, anointing, and then changing your clothes. David's not getting ready to go out on a date. He's not putting on perfume to go impress someone. What is happening is he's completing the process of mourning. Naomi, I think what she is saying is Ruth. Put off the garments of mourning. Take off perhaps the darker clothes that you have been mourning the death of your husband for these three or four or five months or so and change your clothes and tell Boaz by your appearance you're ready to put the grief behind you and look forward. Naomi, I don't have any sense in this passage. She's trying to do anything uh, to be seductive or in any way to be a, a, a tempting uh, allurement to Boaz. She's, Naomi's saying, it's time to stop grieving the past. We, we've grieved the loss of my son and your husband. Wash yourself, anoint yourself, get your cloak. This cloak, one you sleep in. I think she thinks you're gonna be out all night tonight. This is gonna be a long night. And so get your cloak that you can stay warm in. Naomi's not hinting at anything seductive. And so this cloak, if you're trying to get your picture, picture in your head of what might that kind of cloak look like, you need to think Luke Skywalker in the last episode of The Force Awakens, right? He's, he's got a cloak on. That is a cloak. He can stay warm in that. That's probably the kind of, that's not impressive, right? Boaz is not gonna see Naomi in, I mean, Ruth in that and think, whoa, she is fascinatingly beautiful. It's not an impressive garment. It's a practical garment to keep her warm where she's going. And so that scene closes. We move away from the house. Let's move out into the field and get a picture for this, con this conversation. So you're outside, the wind is blowing, it's cool, it's harvest time, uh, kind of the late, later summer, um, and we get this conversation. I'm gonna read this chunk of scripture just to get it before you, verses six through 13. So Ruth went down to the threshing floor and she did as Naomi had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went and lay down at the end of a heap of grain. Now, having eaten and drunk means he had something to drink. It doesn't mean he was inebriated, okay? So he just, he, he, he was, he's feeling good. The harvest is going. He's finished a nice, long, hard day of work and he goes to lie down. At midnight, the man was startled and he turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. Wouldn't you be startled if such a thing happened to you? He, he says, who are you? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, by Yahweh, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear, for I will do all that you ask. For all of my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And it is true that I'm a redeemer, and yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. So remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, then good, let him do it. But if not, and he is, if he is not willing to redeem you, then as Yahweh lives, as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. So lie down. Now question, why does Ruth do this? Why does she, why not just have a conversation? I mean, 
Why go sneaking around in the night in order to, to have this level of, uh, of conversation? And so some have thought that she's being sexually seductive. I don't think that's at all the reason that's going on because number one, we know Boaz is a righteous man. And more likely than not, he would shun her if he thought she was doing something sinful and seductive. Or we also know that um, Naomi has commanded her to do this and she didn't, she said, go and, and lay by him and then he will tell you what to do. She's not giving this command to go use your wily women ways in order to confuse him and awaken him in the night. She's trying to get a conversation. Now, if you think about it, you're a Moabite. Remember from last week, the fact that she is a foreigner has been repeated again and again and again. She has no right to approach a superior in the middle of daytime in order to drum up this kind of conversation. And you wouldn't want to have this kind of conversation with lots of people around because all of the listening ears, good grief, gossip just runs rampant, right? We all know the destruction of gossip. I think Ruth is trying to have a private conversation because he might say no. He might reject her. And in the cover of night would give him, number one, the freedom not to feel any undue pressure from the surrounding environment, from people around or in any other way, for him to look bad in public. So she seeks a private audience. She's a servant. She can't approach him. She's a woman. She can't go to a man. She's a Moabite. She can't approach a, a, a wealthy Israelite landowner in the daytime. I, I'm guessing here. This is not in scripture. This is just Todd trying to figure out what's going on in this passage. But she comes and she says to him, she uncovers his feet. What does that mean? I think she wants him to wake up. Don't you wake up when your feet are cold at night? I do. Good grief. And you're, and you're laying outside and so she pulls back the covers and she just waits. And at midnight, it says he's startled. Um, the word means he trembled. Sometimes it means to tremble with fear. Other times it doesn't. So it doesn't necessarily mean she tickled his feet and freaked him out or something. He's probably cold and he shivered. He probably trembled. He just woke up. And he finds out there's this woman at his feet. Now what she says is amazing. Look at verse nine if you have your Bible. He said to her, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Now spread your wings over your servant for you, you are a redeemer. Now, the, the word wings can also be the corner of a garment. So what is she saying? So some, in, some interpreters would say, spread your wing, your garment. If you, if you go the garment route, it might look like she, she's saying, can I climb under the covers with you? That's not what she's saying. She says, we know this because she said, spread your wings or your garment over your servant for you are a redeemer. Okay, she's saying exactly what she's thinking. You're the redeemer. I need help. We need redemption. I'm willing to marry you, is what she's saying. In fact, <laughs> it's a command. Now that's stunning, right? You have a servant who is commanding someone who is her superior. You have a woman who's giving a directive to this guy. It's in the middle of the night. What on earth do you think he would respond to? But he, he does respond well. I think that, I was trying to figure out, do we have anything in our culture like this? And the closest thing I could come up with is a guy offering his jacket to his girl, right? Husbands, hopefully you still do this. You did it a long time ago if you don't do it anymore. And you ought to do it more frequently. But in this case, it's not just offering a coat to keep warm. It's, it means I'm ready to be enfolded into the fabric of your life. Please enfold me into your life. Will you wrap your coat around me? Will you protect me? Because I'm, I'm willing to marry you. And it is a command because she says, spread your wings over me. But it's amazing that he understands this to be a request. Look at verse 10. Boaz's response. May you be blessed by Yahweh, my daughter. And key words there. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. So evidently there's some age difference here. He refers to her frequently as my daughter. She's much younger and he's saying, I'm impressed with this kindness. You've been kind to me in that you haven't gone after younger, cuter guys, stronger, whether rich or poor, whatever. You're, you're, you're coming after this old man like me. What's the first kindness? 
It goes back to Ruth's promise to be faithful to Naomi, which she didn't have to do. Ruth abandoned her family. She left her hometown. She left everything that she knew. She left any potential in a very comfortable place to come to a new location, new people, new family, and start a new life. That's an act of kindness to take care of your widowed mother-in-law. And so he says, you have been kind. You haven't gone after others to marry. And so now my daughter, verse 11, uh, don't fear. I will do all that you ask. Ruth makes a, a imperative. She makes a command, spread your wings over me. And he receives that as her saying, will you allow me to marry you? He says, I will. So here's this midnight proposal that nobody sees, right? We all want to make big proposals and film it and get all, you know, a camera crew to somebody bows down in a restaurant and the whole world watches or whatever, or it's on, the, you know, the big screen down at, at, the, uh, at the Red Sox Stadium. All kinds of crazy things happen here. Nobody sees this. This is this risky behavior and yet it's righteousness unfolding in a very sweet and protective way. And he's willing to take this risk. Verse 11, I will do all that you ask for all of my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Once again, pointing to the fact, nothing seductive or salacious is happening here. Ruth is completely a woman of integrity. Everybody knows you're a worthy woman. You are a righteous lady. And so I will, I will say yes to you. I'll accept what you're saying. All the townspeople know that you're worthy. So verse 12, there's a problem. So if you're following this in a play, it looks like everything's going along so well. He just said yes. She did something crazy in the middle of the night. The answer, he responds positively. And now something happens. He says this. It is true that I am a redeemer, but here's the problem. There is yet a nearer redeemer. Somebody else is closer to you in relation than I am. So we have to overcome this. So remain tonight. And in the morning, I'll go check it out. If he wants to marry you, then fine, be good. But if not, and notice this, he, he invokes the name of the Lord. He says, by the life of Yahweh, I will marry you if he refuses. Ruth knows she will be taken care of. If you are in the midnight struggle of your life, if you're hiding in the dark, if you are fearful and you're grasping at straws, because this was a pretty extensive leap in the faith, I want you to know there is a redeemer, there is a God who will care for you. Whatever your questions, whatever your fears, whatever your doubts, there is a God who knows that and he will protect you. You just simply have to ask, can you enfold me into your life? Will you take me in? I'm a nobody, I'm a Moabite, I'm a stranger, I'm an outcast, I'm a sinner. I have done unspeakable things. Could you please receive me? This is a little picture of the gospel in the Old Testament. A little hint of how generous our God is to unworthy and undeserving people. And so we, now we move on to this, this little departure. Okay, she's got the good news and he says, lay still, wait until in the morning. Now, how many of you think that actually happened? Right, who could have gone to sleep? I mean, what Boaz is laying there thinking, now, what am I gonna say tomorrow? I've gotta go talk to, you know, neighbor, relative, cousin, whatever. And so I, I need to figure out something to say to him. And, and Ruth is probably thinking, hey, wait till Naomi hears this, right? But what are we gonna do about this guy? And so no, I don't think anybody slept that night, but any, nevertheless, she, they lay there until morning and before dawn, uh, they arise and Boaz does something again, very, very kind. He says, come here. Hold out your, your coat. Let me put in some, some grain. And he pours in plenty that would take care of her. And when Ruth goes home and she shares this information with Naomi, Naomi is thought of. Look at verse 16. And this is scene three. She leaves the threshing field. She goes back home. And in verse 16, when she came home to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? <laughs> Can't you hear it? What happened? Tell me, how did it go? Right? And she told her everything that Boaz had done for her. And she said, these six measures of barley he gave for me, for he said, you cannot go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Now, we might just pass right by that, but this tells us Boaz, he's thinking about Naomi also. 
He says, I don't want, don't go back home. I want you to give this to Naomi. What he's saying, I believe, is I'm going to take care of not just Ruth. I'm going to take care of mother-in-law too. Now, how many of you would do that? You want to invite your mother-in-law into the house with you when you get married? Maybe some of you have. Well, we had a tornado, and uh, I grew up in, in Kentucky. Elisa and I got married in Louisville, and um, just prior to, or after we uh, had gotten married, there was a tornado that destroyed my in-law's house, and I don't know how long we'd been married. Six months? Not very long, and suddenly the in-laws were like, can we come stay with you? <laughs> like, we got a bed, one-bedroom apartment. You guys want to plow in with us? Sure. I guess it was a two-bedroom, but anyway, they, he's saying, it's okay. I'm going to take care of you. I will, I'll take care of mother-in-law too. Ruth, I'm I got you covered if everything works out and I'll take care of mother-in-law too. Boaz is quite a guy. Men in the room have every reason to look up to Boaz for all that he does. And so he's concerned. I don't want you to go back empty-handed. And so this last sentence, verse 18. Now what do we do? She's back home. There's a potential other relative who Ruth does not know. This is another person who has not been kind to Ruth. This is a man whose field she has not been in. She has not found favor in the eyes of this other potential redeemer. What's going to happen? What should we do? Go take another bath and get some more ointment and grab another cloak? No. Verse 18. Wait, my daughter, until you learn how this matter will turn out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. Now we've come full circle. In the very beginning, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, should I not seek your rest? And now Boaz is the guy who's not going to rest. Ruth and Naomi's rest is found in a man who is restless. He would not set still. He's a man who is going to go make sure that this is resolved today. He's a man who's going to do something about their situation. So this word rest, is that a good word? Does anybody need a rest? Does anybody need a nap? Going to go home this afternoon and have a nap? Some of you are napping right now, but <laughs> I couldn't help but think of Jesus' words. Because I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is a descendant of Ruth and Boaz. So if you go back in the family line, we have um, this little, you can't even see that, I'm sorry. I tried to make that as big as I could, but you can't read the names. Maybe you can. This is Boaz and Ruth who are descendants of Rahab and Salmon. If you remember, Rahab was a prostitute who um, survived. She welcomed the spies of Israel. Boaz is their son of Rahab and Salmon. So Boaz and Ruth get married. They have Obed. Obed has Jesse. Jesse has King David. And the descendant of David is who? Some guy called Jesus. That's the point of the book. That's where this book is taking you. The point of the book of Ruth is to lead you to Jesus so that you see the details of life are important to the outworking of God's will. And some of you in this room are aching today. You're you're aching because you feel like God has forgotten you. You feel abandoned. You feel like he doesn't care anything about the difficulty that you're in. And it's not true. This is what this book is intended to help us understand. And so Jesus said something in Matthew chapter 11. He said, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. And what? I will give you what? Rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you. You'll find rest for your souls. Are you resting in Jesus Christ today? You don't have to work for your salvation. You don't have to do things that you think will earn God's favor and and labor yourself out of 
we come up with all kinds of good works, giving your money or serving your time or doing this and doing that as a means of earning God's goodness so that maybe all of your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds when you get to heaven. That's not the gospel. The gospel is Jesus is a man who did not rest until he had atoned for our sins, for all of us who would put our faith and trust in him. He accomplished our salvation and now we can rest in him because he has done what we couldn't do. And so this little picture, way back in the Old Testament, and you're tempted to think, what is the book of Ruth? What's the point? It's not merely some romantic love story. It for between a man and a woman, it is a love story between a redeeming God who goes after wandering, alien, foreign people who love sin and don't love him. And then he redeems us, he pulls us into a relationship so that we can rest in him. That's, that's what Jesus does, it's crazy. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. He does not say, come to me and I'll give you 14 things you have to do every day in order to be saved. It is by faith that we are saved. Yes, we need to do some things. We need to work. But the works flow out of the love. And it doesn't, they're not done in order to earn God's love. And so here, as we, as we come to the end of this, it, it amazes me that Jesus, that Ruth and this theme of rest has come upon us. And so I, I wonder, uh, hear these words of Jesus. In John chapter six, Jesus said, whoever would come to me, I will never cast out. You up for resting in the Lord for your, for your salvation? We're all gonna make mistakes. Anybody make a mistake this week? A sin, not just a mistake. I mean, I mean you've sinned. Anybody? Come on, raise your hand. If you, if you didn't, we, there's a whole, <laughs> you did. <laughs> we all have. What's the, the one commandment that blows me away? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. Does anybody do that? To perf- Did you do that rightly this week? You loved God with all of your being? You sinned this week then. And yet we have Jesus who says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll help you overcome the past. So if you're here today and you know you've sinned, there is forgiveness. There is a God who would say, I will take care of your failings. Come and rest in me. I'll give you life abundantly and I'll give you joy. And this Old Testament picture is part of that. So we're left hanging. We don't know what's gonna happen. You'll have to come back next week. Is the Redeemer gonna show up? Is he going to say yes? Is this guy gonna marry Ruth and Boaz the poor bachelor is out on his nose? Come back next week. But let me close in a word of prayer. Father, I ask you to help every one of us to rest in your wonderful son. Lord, I know there are some of us in this room who are going through some very, very dark times and it feels like midnight. And Lord, I pray that you'd give each of us the faith to just reach out and say, would you spread your wings over me? Would you enfold me into your life? Would you rescue me from my sin? Would you forgive me? And your word, Jesus, your word says you will never cast out anybody who comes to you. May every person in this room come to you in faith right now. Faith for life, faith for just getting through the day, faith for health. As we get older, our bodies fall apart. Give us the faith to keep trusting in you. And Jesus, I pray that you'd give those of us in this room who are struggling to see you as beautiful and to see you as a wonderful savior, would you give us the the ability to see you? Would you open up the eyes of our heart? May you reveal yourself today and this week to those people who are seeking you because I know you answer prayer. And Lord, if if anyone in this room would say, God, if, if you're real, Jesus, if you're alive, would you let me see you? I know you'll answer that prayer. So Lord, thank you for Boaz. I thank you for Ruth. Thank you for this curious midnight maneuver and this dawning of a new day with a cape full of grain. Would you fill us with your love? Fill every heart in this room. And so I pray, God, fill us as we sing.
through Christ I pray, amen.